Okay, great. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad that you joined us. Um, we've got a nice cozy group this afternoon. My name's Neil Kalen. Um, welcome to What's Up With Us. I'm joined today by John Richards, John J.R. Richards, there he is, and by Ashley Peterson. And we have a fabulous guest today, and that's Kelly Corder. Hi, Kelly. Look at that. She gets the whole... Uh -huh. <laughs> Hello, I like that. So we've got so much to talk about. We're really excited about today's What's Up With Us, a monthly event here sponsored by the Real Property Law Section. So let's kind of get right into it, see what we have. Well, we did our introductions. I'm going to do a little What's Up With Ashley May um, in just a few minutes. We've got a hot topic about a brand new statute that took effect January 1st. We'll get, then we'll have our interview with Kelly and we're going to talk real briefly about three relatively recent cases, see what you have to say about them, make some announcements. Hopefully we'll get some input from some of you, any of you, all of you. We'll see and want to make sure you're aware of our next What's Up With Us webinar on Thursday, February 18th. So let's get into, well, okay, here's our also <laughs> cast. Just announced them, don't they look good? I was gonna be talking about cases today, so I thought I would be putting on appropriate attire, but I couldn't actually find my um, British wig to actually wear um, in person today. So I have it in the photo, glad to see that. Everybody else is looking really good. Glad to have again, JR and Ashley join us. And let's see, let's go into what's up with Ashley May. So in a recent what's up, we learned that Ashley's real name is May. And that kind of reminded me, Ashley May sort of reminded me of the Beverly Hillbillies and good old Ellie May. So I thought, is Ashley more Beverly Hillbilly or Beverly Hills? So let's see, what do you think? So I was trying to think who would epitomize Beverly Hills. <laughs> so I came up with Eva Cabana with these two, and I thought, you know, yeah. I'm really aging myself. And so, you know, I don't know who's going to be listening to this. Maybe no one is my age. I thought, let's try and do something a little more recent. I said, aha! Was that Josh Hawks 4? Is that who that was, Neil? That's, that's from Did like Josh the 80s. <laughs> it's like the 80s. It's like, that's 30 years ago. <laughs> I realized I'm still aging myself, but I thought, you know, there's Ashley Young, single, hanging out, you know, but I wanted to do something a little bit more current for what people think of as Beverly Hills today. And what do we have? What do people think of Beverly Hills today? This is what people think uh... of Beverly Hills today, right? And so I thought, which is Ashley more like <laughs> right? <laughs> Beverly Hillbilly or Beverly Hills. And I have to tell you, oh, I think man. Ashley is all class all the time. So that's my answer to that. And we'll let the rest of you decide on oh, your own. Yeah. Oh, my God. I hope I JR really finds out my middle name um, <laughs> when he's in charge of one of these programs. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to dig into that. We're digging into your whole background, Neil. There we go. There we go. That's what yeah. worries me. That's yeah. what worries me. I might be canceled um, soon. We'll, <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> so let's start off before we get to earning you. Let's start off with a couple of hot topics. This is really breaking news yesterday and today. So we just got some announcements. I didn't even have a chance to look any of these things up. But I thought I would share this, you know, with our audience. And then if you come across something, you want to look these up yourselves, but a few important things. So the CDC, so that's the Federal Eviction Moratorium that was scheduled to go through January 31st of this year, which coincided with the California Eviction Moratorium, which also <laughs> goes through January 31st. Guess what? Been extended by executive order. I also saw there was an announcement from the CDC director saying the same thing, that the federal eviction moratorium is gonna run through the end of March. Right? I'm sorry, so Neil, got some... a quick question, but we haven't heard anything from the governor's office on the eviction moratorium, whether it's extended, correct? Correct, have not heard anything. 
of course, with California, that's by legislation. So there are a couple of bills in the legislature to extend the California moratorium. One of them will extend the California moratorium through the end of December of this year. You know, who knows what will happen with bills once they start going through the process. But right, there's not much time, right? There's only 10, 10 days left for California to figure out if they're gonna do an extension before the California one expires. But will it matter that much? Probably not given the federal extension for another two months. So that it's very tricky trying to figure out um, which one is going to apply. When California first came out with it, they said, oh no, no, the California rule applies, not the federal rule because the California rule was more protective. And it was in some instances, but it was less protective in other instances. So which one would actually apply is kind of anybody's guess at this point. So it's kind of consistent with the federal eviction moratorium, FHA, FHFA, which oversees Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. What have they done? They extended the moratorium on single family foreclosures, right? And on evictions for those who have not been able to make their payments. That one only went through, or only goes through February of this year. My guess is that's probably gonna be made consistent with the other one as well. And you see the bottom two items there, the US Department of Agriculture. Well, you don't see a lot of these type of loans, USDA loans in the cities, but out in the more rural areas, you could see a lot of USDA loans. What are they doing? They're extending their eviction and foreclosure moratorium again through March, through the end of March of this year. And just announced just this morning, FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, just, just put out today a mortgagee letter. I've got the number over there for you, those who want to look it up. And what are they doing? They're doing the same thing. They're announcing a moratorium on foreclosures and evictions again through March 31st of this year. So interesting stuff. If you're following this stuff, may want to try to get the underlying sources. I didn't have time to get those for you this morning, but I wanted to make sure you are aware of what's going on in the real property world. So here's our regular hot topic. Wanted to mention something not directly real estate related, but affects all employers and employees in the state of California. And there's a notice that employers have to give, not just to employees, but also independent contractors. If the employer was notified about a potential exposure to COVID-19 in the workplace. So where it's Assembly Bill 685, the two primary labor code sections are there, 6325, 6409.6. Some of the important things to know about that. So if a employee notifies the employer, hey, guess what? When I was at the workplace, I was in my infectious period for COVID-19, the employer then has one business day to notify all employees that were also in the workplace during that same period of time. So I don't know if people are keeping track of who's in their workplace on every particular day. If not, you're probably gonna have to send out a notice to all employees. Now me, I haven't been in my workplace in nine months, right? But some people do have to go to their workplace. A lot of essential workers are at their workplace. It's important to know lawyers are employers. Lawyers are also employees. Lawyers may be contractors, depending on who they're working for. So important to know, again, the time to give this notice within one business day after the employer has received the notification about a potential right uh, infection of, or the potential exposure of employees and independent contractors to COVID-19. Wanted to make sure you are aware of that. Okay, that takes care of our updates really quick this afternoon. Want to make sure we have time to have JR do our interview of Kelly Porter. And I'm going to turn the mic over and I'm going to unmute myself. Welcome, JR. Welcome, Kelly. Yes. Yeah, so Hi, Kelly. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kelly Corder. She is a yoga instructor based out of San Diego, California. Her practice 
focuses on breath work, mindfulness, and connection. And the foundation of her practice is the vinyasa and is it hatha? Correct, yes. Yeah. And the coolest thing is, is she is teaching a webinar, a free web webinar for our real property section, February 6th, which is a Saturday. And we'd like everybody to come along with that. We're, it's part of our wellness uh, work that we're trying to do. And um, I believe, Ash, correct me if I'm wrong, that we're not charging for the event, but we are asking, uh, people are allowed to make a contribution to Kelly and we're asking that people actually do that. Is that right? Uh, we're definitely not charging because there's no, it's not a CLE class. It's just a Zoom interactive uh, video like today and Kelly will be teaching the class and you can participate and join along and you're more than welcome to donate to Kelly, if you like the class and enjoy it for sure. So we will make sure to give you her uh, Venmo or PayPal info. Oh, great. So Kelly had some really interesting stuff. I have a full on interview with Kelly that we're going to publish uh, next month in our e bulletin or e what's it called now? E news. <laughs> but she said some really interesting thing about monetizing yoga and how that's not actually part of the true practice of yoga, which I thought were. You just had so many wonderful things to share there, Kelly. I hope uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to publishing that article. But so yeah. one of the things, um, you're, you're available really all over the web. If you just sure. Google your name, I mean, I saw it on Facebook, Instagram. Yes, you tell can find your, Tell me about your online presence and where you are and what you're- Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I am from a, a practice of yoga called vinyasa and hatha. And in my teacher training, we were almost taught to build walls with our students and not interact um, in a social media presence, if you will. Um, and this pandemic obviously has broken a lot of walls down. And I needed a way to access a lot of people immediately and I had to follow my heart and what felt best and so um, I started teaching classes virtually on behalf of the yoga studios I was working for when they were open still and from there I have started to sprinkle yoga in every aspect of my life whether it's sitting here in a zoom call and making a call to mindfulness for us to sit tall lean back take a breath, or if it is in a physical yoga class, an exercise and yoga class. Yeah. Cool. So um, if I wanted to find you for a live class, where would I go? Would it be? Sure. So if you live anywhere in the world, then the best way to reach me would be on Instagram. And okay. there I have live classes where you can interact while the class is live and okay. you can catch the class anytime thereafter and save it. So if you like a class, you can take the same one every day if you love it. And uh, then YouTube is definitely the, e I find to be the easiest interface because it has the classes organized by style and type so that once you find your niche or what works for you, then you have a, something already curated for you on the platform. And it, they're both free. So one of the things I think you were talking about how, I mean, a lot of us associate yoga with a type of exercise or stretching or uh, certainly breath work, right? But you were, you were talking a little bit about how there's more to yoga than that even. If, if we look at it, that's just a percentage of what yoga really stands for. Is that right? Yes, I do think that to understand an Eastern philosophy and concept, we do have to relate it to Western concepts to help us understand how grand and expansive it is and that yoga is a lifestyle and not just this exercise performed on a mat, for lack of a better word. And yoga is this giant tree with eight branches and the physical performance on the mat, which we will be doing with one another in February, is one eighth of the practice of yoga in scope um, whether it 
it is, it truly is. But it's yeah. it's science, philosophy, breath work. Uh, there's so much more to it. So I think everyone needs to um, remember that there are so many kinds of yoga that might serve you better than just the acrobatics you might see through social media on a mat because that's got to go. <laughs> Well, along those lines, okay, like what kind of advice would you give to a beginner like myself who really, I'm not really that limber and I'm not, I'm not acrobatic for, for, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. you, what kind of advice would you give to me if I wanted to start practice today online, you know, that kind of thing? What, what, what kind of tips would you give me? I would definitely remind yogis to keep their courage with them because it can feel intimidating getting to know something new and getting to know your body as well at the same time. And it takes great courage to filter out the things that you aren't going to participate in as much as the things that you do. And when we take a fitness class, uh, we often do exactly what we're told without thinking, and that has its benefits. It certainly does. But when you're practicing yoga, it's like your teacher is giving you a menu of 10 foods that you can have for dinner, and you don't have to eat all of them, and you don't have to clear your plate. So if you choose to sit there in observation, or if you are in pain and you um, aren't looking to participate physically the entire class, that does take great courage to omit what might not feel right or to try something new. So I always try to remind people to um, to not push themselves too hard and that it's great to skip things. Not every cue is for you. So and that's a word that I've heard quite often. I'm not sure I understand it. The word cue used in the sure. context of yoga. Does that just mean a, a what does cue mean? <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. It's, rather than a pool cue, we're talking about right. um, the the verbiage that I'll use like a, a dance instructor or a coach that helps you align your, your physical body and movement. Point your toes outward, lift your heart to the sky. That's an example of a cue. Okay, yeah. so we might be in a position, but the cue would be like straighten your torso or your back or something like that right yeah. that's the cue the, yes the, even something as simple as inhale and exhale is the cue that I will give but it's not to demand you to immediately stop the breath you're taking to cater to what I have cued but rather um, put it in your playlist order when you're done with right. one song then you add in the next and you don't have to skip or hurry to get there mm. I get you so one of the things I'm really curious about is, is so you may know, um, it's actually a common knowledge at this point that attorneys have uh, substance, accelerated substance abuse problems and they deal generally with a lot of adversity and stress. So we all do, but it's kind of desiccated with attorneys and accelerated for lack of a better way to put it. So mm -hmm. say, for somebody that is experiencing those things, like how could yoga or the practice of yoga help them deal with that? That's a great question for such a high stress job. Uh, I like to think of yoga as a yogi toolbox. You have a toolbox with a couple different things that can help you. And each day you're going to have to pick something different that serves you best. And so it's a, I guess I'll give you two parts to that answer. One is that um, that yoga can be a great substitution as an, an activity that gives you an immediate benefit to add to your life um, when you are looking to have a completely different change of pace. It's always available for you. And then there's also the realistic side of yoga where if you're facing an addiction issue to to be kind with yourself and perhaps incentivize yourself with I am allowed to X, Y, and Z if I have meditated for 10 minutes, if I have practiced yoga for 30 minutes. And if you give yourself this discipline, it might give you a bit more freedom and control in whatever addiction you might be going through. So. Well, like one of the things that's helped me, and again, I'm not really good at yoga. I'm not going to pretend like I know what I'm doing, but 
it has become so much of what I do is goal oriented. Like I need to get to this point and everything like that. And the, the, a lot of the focus in yoga for me at least has been accepting, you know, what, what my body can do that day or what I can do that day. And mm -hmm. very freeing in that regard. I mean, is that part of kind of what you would encourage people to do? Yes, I definitely know how challenging it is to turn off the goal orientation when you are in your yogic practice because it's not mimicking your time off of the mat. You have a great state of awareness on the mat and then there might be some incongruencies off of the mat. But the perseverance that we talk about both in yoga and in your line of work is that there's this steadfastness about you um, despite there being a delay in your success. So even if you know that you're not going to reach the goal, you're still just as determined to stick to it despite the defeats you might feel. And that practice will uh, rejuvenate you because no one has regretted going to yoga. I have never met a person in my entire life who has uh, not benefited from the practice. So I have to remind myself like, you do this for a reason, you'll feel 10 times better and much more well-equipped to handle the problem you have after you have yoga first, then tackle. I think I actually feel like, you know, incrementally better just talking to you for five, five minutes. <laughs> so thank you for, for that, it's really nice. Yeah. Hey, I have a question yeah. for Colin. Yeah, let's do it. So. I've never done yoga, I've never been to a yoga class. I don't know anything about it other than what you just said from the last, you know, seven minutes. Sure. So a couple of questions I have for you. One, if I were interested or anybody who would be interested in, is there like a preliminary step? Should somebody read a book? Should somebody watch a class? Should somebody just go to a class? So that's one question. And then the second question is, I don't know. Is is it like is it like dance? Are there beginner, intermediate, advanced classes, or or am I going to show up to something and people are you know putting their legs behind their heads, you know, and you know bending all over? I'm like, what am I going to do here? I can barely you know bend over and touch my toes. I don't know. You know what would be appropriate for somebody who hasn't experienced yoga. This, these are great questions that I have asked myself regularly. I would say anyone new to the practice to feel less anxiety and to ex know what to expect that watching a yoga class without participating in it online is a great way to start or to audio listen to a yoga class to just see what's up and what it looks like. Uh, in the past, I might say drop into my class that's at a physical location to be curious, but we have to work. The modern yogi has new challenges. And the other thing that I would say is that if you are looking for a class that's labeled gentle versus advanced, that you will be able to find what you're looking for. So to follow your heart when it comes to, shall we practice a gentle yoga class or are you looking for a level three vinyasa? Likely not. The first yoga class I ever took was a level two Ashtanga practice, which is the, the yoga practice made for television. If I were to give you some like acrobatic beauty, that's what I attended. And I remember asking the teacher after class, what class is more appropriate for me? This doesn't seem like it fits. And she told me I was right where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand it for five or six years. And I just kept going to class because I was so curious. Uh, so I would say just an open mind. And if you're anxious, then give it a peek virtually first to ease the unknown. And I can say too, Kelly has a really awesome chair yoga class, which is great for us attorneys that are sitting all day in a chair at our desks. So definitely check it out on our YouTube page because I've found it to be very uh, helpful, especially from sitting all day. It just gets you to move a little bit, stretch out. And I've had the pleasure of working with Kelly for the last almost two years now, I think, yes. and taking her classes. And I'm just so, so fortunate at her 
energy, her positivity, and the, the class levels have been so manageable for me because I'm not a crazy acrobatic yogi either, but I, I just love it. So I definitely recommend checking those out. Thank you so much. It's been a great uh, web that we have woven with one another. Yoga brings the greatest people together. <sighs> so if you haven't spotted it, Beth Pierce, our wonderful assistant, has just posted the link to register for this great class that Kelly's going to be teaching. So I'm going <laughs> to register for it right now. And how great is it to have the uh, incredibly talented uh, Kelly Corder here with us today to talk about yoga. Hopefully this has ignited some enthusiasm with you and we'll see you on the 6th of February. And thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. I really look yeah. forward to February and for all levels, welcome to come spend some time with me on the mat. Thanks. I'll be there. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kelly. You know what? You're welcome to stick with us. If, if there's anything in the law that interests you, you're welcome to join us. If you, if you feel you want to um, excuse yourself, you're welcome to do that as well. It was a pleasure, again, having you. And again, for those who are in the listening audience, in the chat room, there's posted the way to register for the upcoming class. So great. And, and the link for her can. and the link for her chair yoga. Uh, Beth just posted that as well. Awesome. Oh, cool. Thank yeah, you. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. So, you know, I, I'm sorry I stepped away for a minute. I realized when you started talking, Kelly, that I looked like a test pattern with my striped <laughs> shirt. And I thought, you know, I don't want anybody, you know, with, you know, kind of issues, like they say at the beginning of a movie with strobe lights, you know, to have problems with, with this what's up. So just put on a, a plain, black, plain black sweater here, so I won't be giving anybody any problems. Um, and we're ready to move on. So that was great. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Kelly. And let's talk about some cases that came out recently. And so the first one here, we got the tree and we got the roots. And that kind of fits right in with Kelly's talk. So it's a perfect lead in here. And the case is Russell versus Mann, decided in November of last year. And I, again, it's so fortunate for me to have, you know, Ashley and Jaya here because I have the kind of practice where I, I don't go out. Um, I, I talk to real estate agents all day, but JR and Ashley, they actually talk to real clients, you know, all day. So they can give some great, you know, input about what kind of issues that they're seeing with their clients if any of these things come up. So let's take a quick look at uh, Russell versus Mann here. Well, a tree case, right? A lot of trees, a lot of tree problems, a lot of native problems in California. In this case, we had a tree that was uh, what a coterminous tree. It was actually on the property line. Um, one of the neighbors was a builder. He bought a vacant lot in order to build on his lot. What did he do? He had to prepare the foundation. In doing so, he cut the tree roots, damaged the tree so much that the tree died. Well, the other neighbor who already had their home uh, said, wow, this was just this big majestic tree. I missed that tree. And that neighbor decided to sue the builder for damages. What did the trial court do? The trial court awarded triple damages. Look at this, over $200,000. It was kind of weird looking at the opinion because the opinion said um, over $70,000 of damages. And I don't know, um, the numbers didn't exactly quite work out for me, but it doesn't matter. We're talking about a lot of money, over $200,000 in damages. And so, of course, the builder wasn't too happy about it. The builder decided to appeal. What do we know about the law generally with neighbors? Well, one has the right to cut encroaching tree roots, provided the person who cuts them does not damage the tree. Civil code statute on that. Um, but the civil code statute that the court used to award triple damages, 3346, really only applies if there is a trespass, an intentional crossing over the boundary line to injure timber, right? So now what you'll find in most neighbor-neighbor disputes, I'm relying on 3346. So here what happened, the builder appealed, 
Um, the court said, well, no, no, no. The builder was not liable under 3346. There should not have been triple damages. The builder should have been liable for negligence and reduce the award down to $37,000. Now, portions of this opinion were not published. So maybe there was something in the unpublished portion that would help one understand how the appellate court came to the $37,000 figure. I could not figure that out from the published portion of the opinion, but it doesn't matter. What matters here is that triple damages was denied relying on 3346 was inappropriate in a case like this. There's a really nice discussion, JR, you were just talking about the e-news. There's a real nice discussion about this. The real property law section e-news just came out two days ago, I think. Real nice discussion there, article by Michael Kerbs. I don't know, have the, either of you seen, you know, neighbor problems, issue problems? Go ahead, Jer. I mean, I see these all the time. I get a lot of calls on neighbor issues and I've had it everywhere between a shrubbery, somebody cuts the shrubbery down to full on, like look at that tree that you're seeing that on your graphic right there. Imagine that it's on the property line. Well, both, both neighbors have a duty to maintain that tree. But what if one of the neighbors basically cuts a straight line, let me see if I, a straight line on the tree so the branches don't go over on its property. And then that causes severe damage or kills the tree. That's where I have a problem with this decision. If you have to cross over the boundary to get into trouble with this 3346, I don't think that's exactly fair. I mean, he, if you have a neighbor that intentionally cuts all the branches that go over onto their side, it kills the tree. I think it should apply. So anyway, it's kind of interesting. It's interesting that that one had to do with roots. It's a little bit different. Um, but I thought that triple damage is only applied if it was malicious. So I think that's interesting too, in this case, because he was a developer. Ash? You yeah, well, I think that's why the court obviously overturned it because they thought the trouble damages was excessive. It was should have just been negl general negligence damages because it wasn't, you know, I don't think it was malicious. And plus the county approved the building plans that allowed them to cut the tree down. So, oh. or the <laughs> roots, say. Right, it allowed them to cut the roots in order to put their foundation in place, right? right. The, the, uh, it's interesting that the, that the appellate justices, they mention that in their view, <laughs> approval never should have been given. But as you say, actually, it doesn't matter if it never should have been given, approval was given, right? It was given, yeah. Yeah, it was given, so. That yeah, I, I, in my, in what I do when I talk to real estate licensees, we hear a lot about, you say not so much about the roots, we hear a lot about people wanting to cut branches. A lot yep. of times branches are hanging over. I, I know just in my house, my neighbor has two huge trees. <clears throat> of course, the way things always work out, my neighbor is to the north of me. The wind is always from the north. My pool is constantly filled up with my neighbor's leaves. I, I've cut back to, to our fence line a couple of times. In my case, it doesn't make a difference. The trees are so massive and they let go so many leaves. That's just kind of the nature, I guess. You have a pool, you gotta live up, live with some inconvenience. Just too bad for me that the wind doesn't blow the other way around. So it all would have stayed on my neighbor's property. But I hear more of that than I do about tree root problems. Yeah, I do too. I get a lot of calls about that. And, it's, and most people are like, can't I sue? Cause they cut my tree branches. I'm like, well, if they were on their property line then and it didn't kill the tree, then sorry, there's not much you can do. Right, yeah. Can't I sue, can't I sue, a very common so uh, another common uh, one, just, I just want to throw this out there. We can move on. But um, people cut, trimming trees that are on HOA uh, common area, they don't like that the com they're not maintaining the trees and it blocks their view. So they go onto HOA property and cut it down. Bad idea, folks. Don't do that. <laughs> You're gonna, don't do it. <laughs> we have a, JR, did you see the comment that was just posted by uh, Michael? I did. I did. That's crazy. It's going to be hard to overturn if they had the, the waiver of fact, uh, facts on, uh, what's that, 1462 waiver? waiver should, uh, of, you want to repeat the comment since we're on a... We're oh, crazy. yeah, sure. Uh, Michael Petcher uh, said, uh, I have a remarkable tree case at present. One side cut down five trees ostensibly on the neighbor's side. 
They settled for a considerable amount of money. A later survey showed the trees were on the cutter's side. We are seeking to rescind the settlement agreement. Uh, really? They basically said the Court of Appeals held that the agreement is rescindable of the appeal uh, is from a demur. Interesting, interesting case. I would tend to say that'd be hard to overturn a settlement agreement, but so it looks like the Court of Appeals disagrees with that. So interesting. So to me, one of the things that's interesting about Michael's comment, and thank you for participating, Michael, is, is that the survey was conducted so much later, right? Rather than, rather than um, at the commencement of the dispute, which may have resolved the dispute, or at least given one party more leverage over the other party. Um, now I realize, you know, surveys are expensive and maybe somebody said it wasn't worth spending the money you know, at the early point in, in the litigation. But when you see something like that, you say, wow, you know, maybe that would have been money well spent um, if it was done earlier on rather than later on. I realize those are judgment calls to make. Um, and sometimes it's hard to figure out, you know, it's always, it's easy to look back afterwards and say, man, they should have done that originally. But parties have different reasons and their lawyers have different reasons for doing and not doing things. You can't always blame somebody for not doing it. Oh, here we go. And uh, Michael just answered that there was no time for the survey. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. And then some some complex uh, issues there dealing with his client, but there was no time for the survey. Okay. So thank you for that input. Glad uh, glad to hear, you know, that we're talking about something that's relevant to our WhatsApp listening audience. Well, let's see what our next case is about. And uh, case just decided this year, earlier this year, Lee versus, I'm not sure how to pronounce the other name, Codiluck, maybe, or Cody Luck. And here was what's happened in this case. So um, on June 4th, and I can't remember the year, but an owner of the property named Haynes files a three-day notice to cure against uh, against the tenant, Codiluck. Um, what was the Cadillac doing? Well, he had a, he was renting the property. The lease said it was to be used basically as a bookstore, a card store, general sundries and gifts. And what was the allegation that he was selling marijuana without an appropriate license? So, what, filed the three day notice, nothing happened in the three days. The tenant did not move out. The tenant did not stop uh, selling the marijuana. A couple of weeks later, Lee acquires title to the property. Lee then brings an unlawful detainer action against the tenant. The day before the trial, the tenant requests a judgment on the pleadings. So JR, I'm gonna leave it to you to, to maybe explain to people like me who don't do any litigation exactly what that means. But Lee said, well, wait a minute. They're, the tenant said, wait a minute. Um, the notice was defective, right? Um, first of all, because Lee, the person who served the unlawful detainer, he didn't serve the notice, right? Um, and that was the primary allegation. There was another one in this case as well. The trial court says, you're right, you're right. The person who filed the unlawful detainer did not file the notice. I'm, I'm dismissing the unlawful detainer, sir. Tenant was awarded almost $26,000 in fees and costs. So the current owner, the owner Lee appealed and on appeal, the court, the judgment of the trial court was reversed. Now, as it turns out, as, as mentioned in the appellate decision, that at the time this was on appeal, the tenant had already left the property and they were arguing that this was moot, right? But Lee was saying, well, no, it's not moot the tenant was awarded $26,000 in fees and costs. So, and the tenant shouldn't have won this case at all. And the court said, the court agreed that the, the case was not moot. There was ongoing issues here that were relevant. The court looked at the Code of Civil Procedure, 1161. And I said, well, first of all, there's nothing in the statute that says you have to identify to whom the property will be returned at the time of the three-day notice to cure or quit. So the court dismissed that argument. And the court said also, there's explicit language in the statute 
that allows a successor to maintain an action that was brought by the predecessor. Well, of course, Haynes did not file the action, the actual lawsuit before Lee took possession, but Haynes started the process, right? By filing the three-day notice to cure. And it said here, well, the new owner can rely on that notice given. I know we get that question frequently at the California Association of Realtors, which is, you know, people are transferring property. There's a tenant. The question is, can the successor continue a process that was begun by the prior owner? So I hear this come up um, frequently. What about you? Yeah, I have, I have the same thing, Neil. I feel like this is like, I'm actually very shocked that the trial court awarded for the tenant because I feel like this was something that was already pretty established in the law that you have privity as a successor and in interest to continue to sue on any notices previously served. So I, I was a little surprised at the trial court's ruling on this one. Yeah, I mean, you know, it just, uh, you know, the notices for any eviction have to be completely correct. Uh, you know, like sterling silver, just there can't be any errors. And so, you know, a lot of trial court judges will look for any error, any reason to dismiss a case based on an error in the notice. So it seems to me like the, the court jumped the gun on this because it's pretty clear where the law stands. Yeah, because I mean, the same thing, like leases are, you know, basically just assumed by the buyer as well. So like if you sell a property, there's a lease in place, the buyer is taking it subject to that lease. So it'd be the same situation with the unlawful detainer. So interesting to me that the court felt the need to publish the case mm -hmm. because they could have said, this is established law. There's, there's, it does not fit the criteria for publication. I kind of like it because in, in my practice, it's something really recent to point to, to say, yes, you know, you can assign your interest, which actually was done in this case. You can assign your interest and we can make the arguments. It's, it's really nice to have a really current decision that you could just point to as um, evidence that the successor has these rights. Mm -hmm. Well, and, uh, just an interesting point. So if like four different people own the property, not all four people need to be the plaintiffs in the case. It could be just be any one owner uh, that could be the plaintiff. So you don't have to spend all the money or time and effort to have everybody represented in the lawsuit. So it's a, that's an interesting issue. Yeah, well, thank you for that extra. Yeah, eviction, evictions are not title. They're not title defenses. <laughs> All right, well, let's go on to our, our third case, which I don't have something to really um, show you, but I, I wanted to, I mean, this really is current. It's the Apartment Association of Los Angeles County, also known as the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles, AAGLA, versus the City of Los Angeles. And it's a federal court action, and AAGLA sued the city saying that their eviction moratorium was a violation of their constitutional rights. Uh, the suit was brought in federal district court. Uh, the, the apartment association uh, tried to receive a preliminary injunction for continued enforcement to stop continued enforcement by the city. The apartment association was denied their preliminary injunction and therefore they've appealed it's now before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. The opening briefs have been filed. The reply, the um, answering briefs has been filed. I think there's still two weeks left for any reply briefs that might be filed. On the docket, at least as of two days ago, there was no timetable set for this case to be heard. Uh, you know, of course, who really knows exactly what's gonna happen as we mentioned at the beginning with the state eviction moratorium, the, the city eviction moratorium really stands on its own. So we're gonna see what happens. Again, we're just dealing now with the preliminary injunction aspect of this case. No matter what happens, whether parties are gonna pursue something based on winning or losing at the preliminary injunction level, or whether they're just gonna move forward and try to go to the substance will be another issue. But I wanted to point out a few 
a few things that were raised in this case. Again, some of you may have a practice, this might be relevant to you. You can look that up yourselves. I think it's, I think it's PACER where the, where the federal, um, I think PACER is the federal court system for this. So when was the complaint filed? Just earlier this year, August of 2020. It was a facial challenge to the moratorium and the, and the rent freeze, making arguments under the fifth and 14th amendment of the constitution, as well as the impairment of contracts clause. They've also said it was an unlawful taking. What are the, what's the apartment association really arguing on behalf of the apartment owners? That, wait a minute, this relief, it's not temporary. It's not conditional. It's been going on for the better part of a year. And there's certain parts of it that give the tenants a, a, a year after LA declares the state of emergency over. Who knows when that's gonna be? So what are the apartment owners saying? They're saying, wait a minute, this is not some kind of short-term emergency, um, emergency rule that we can understand, we can live with. This can be going on for a long, long time. It's not narrowly tailored relief. I already said the district court denied the preliminary injunction. Looking at the briefs that have been filed to date, well, what is the city side saying? They're saying, wait a minute, courts, you have to give great deference you know, to the lower court's decision. Uh, the lower court has found that there's no irreparable harm to the property owners, the apartment owners. After all, it's not a rent forgiveness ordinance. It's just a delay, right? Sure, you can't evict people. You still have the right to sue them. So the court said, there's no irreparable, the, the um, defendants here said, there's no irreparable harm, it's just delay. There's still the ability to try to collect the money that's owed to you um, in, in the future. Now, a lot of property owners would say, you've left me that right, but it's not a real remedy. That people who are not in a position to pay are not, you're giving me basics. Basically, even if we pursue them, we're gonna have a worthless judgment at the end of this. So they said, we are gonna be irreparably harmed because of the length of time this has been going on. One of the other arguments that they're making is, well, very current to what's going on now, right? There's money that's going to be made available to landlords from city and federal government. And a lot of that goes to what we talked about originally, which is, uh, is there going to be another <coughs> stimulus bill issued by the federal government that will allow for money to be going to directly to landlords mm -hmm. in addition to tenants? So what they're saying is we have wide discretion in the case of emergency. You need to balance the equities. Since this is a preliminary injunction, apartment owners, you've got no likelihood of success in the merits. Therefore, the denial of the preliminary injunction was appropriate. So again, something still going on. Um, a hearing date at the appellate level for the denial of the preliminary injunction has not yet been set, at least as of a couple of days ago. I don't know, Ashley, JR, anything you want to add about this? I mean, I thought the Apartment Association in their brief made some really strong arguments um, in favor of property owners and landlords who are suffering right now. I mean, they're, they're not getting hardly any, you know, I guess, uh, recourse in this whole thing. And like you were saying, I mean, sure, they're, so the tenants are supposed to pay all this money back when the moratorium ends, but good luck getting a lot, you know, a judgment against them that's going to be able to be collected. I mean, most of these tenants move out and leave the state, and then you can't sue them in small claims court. And what are you supposed to do if you can't serve them? You, you, then you have no recourse at all. So I, I think, and I've been advising my clients that it's probably unlikely they'll get that rent back once the moratorium lifts. And that's the truth of the matter is so um, also, you know, either the tenant is not, they can't collect, but like in a commercial context, they, uh, a landlord may have a personal guarantee, but if this person's running up a hundred thousand dollar rent bill and they're personally liable, I mean, the, and they file for bankruptcy, for example, you'll never, you'll never get that because there's no fraud involved. There's no tort involved with not paying rent. I mean, they just couldn't pay the rent. So yeah. The, 
the ramifications of this, I think the, the legislature is dealing with this the best they can. I mean, I'm sympathetic, but gosh, is, if the system isn't broke, I mean, it really is broken. <laughs> it's not working. So I don't know what to say other than that. So, yeah. so actually, you mentioned you had, you had read the briefs. And when I was reading the briefs, I was really kind of touched by the fact that on both sides of the issue, so much of the briefs on both sides we're really making policy arguments um, as opposed to pure legal arguments. And we, 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 maybe we like to pretend um, that the courts are just gonna consider the law, right? Um, and that it's up to the legislature to consider the policy. But when you see so much, you see so much um, pulling at heartstrings on both sides in this case, they're, they're really making really policy arguments that in theory are better directed at the legislature to provide a solution rather than the courts to provide a solution. I'm not saying that the, that the briefs were devoid of legal arguments. They had legal arguments. Um, they, both sides, they had legal arguments, but it just seemed to me there was an incredible amount of policy arguments that were being addressed in the briefs on both sides. Well, and I think it really comes down to two is the question of, you know, how much power do these mayors have, you know, with regards to these temporary emergency orders? I mean, are they going beyond their scope of, of their limited powers with these temporary orders, which are supposed to be temporary, like you said, and now these are lasting a year, two years, whatnot. So is it is it an encroachment in that, you know, overarching powers here or what? I don't, I don't know. That's just, I think that's one of the questions to be considered in all this though. And, and I believe both sides cited the recent Supreme Court decision out of New York mm -hmm. um, that I held that, that, well, I can't remember if it was the governor or the mayor went too far in restricting the ability of places of worship mm -hmm. to, to hold, I think, outdoor services if they were, you know, keeping appropriate social distancing and, and uh, facial covering, I, I believe. Um, yeah. So they both were relying on that and we'll see, you know, if, if the um, Ninth Circuit, you know, you picks up on that either by distinguishing it because one would say, well, wait a minute, owning rental property is not protected, protected, you know, in the Constitution, under the Bill of Rights, right? But there's still private property rights um, in the Constitution. So we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I see. So thank you, Franz, for listening. And you, you raised a good point that I think the courts are going to have to address here, which is what does temporary mean, right? And Ashley just raised that, which is, you know, it's temporary a month. It's going on at least nine months. And there's a potential for a lot of this to go on through at least mid-year next year, if not through the end of next year. And then beyond, so we'll have to see, you know, so, when is an end? So, yeah. so I have a case where uh, my client is a uh, you know middle class guy who sublet part of his house that he rents to another person who has not paid rent since October of 2019. We got a judgment against this guy. I mean, yeah, we got a, a we had a stipulated judgment against the subletter. But basically, we cannot evict this person whatsoever mm. from Alameda County because they're not issuing writs of possession. This person has been in the house for over a year, rent-free, and as Ashley pointed out, is uncollectible. So my client can't afford to give this guy housing. He's, you know, it's just... the. It's a really tough situation for a lot of There life. are a lot of small property owners, property owners who own one, two, three, maybe four properties. You know, everybody who owns property does not own hundreds of units. And there's a big difference in impact on somebody who is relying on that income. Um, a lot of retirees, rel that, that was their 401k, was the property mm -hmm. that they owned that was rental property. And there's a big difference and the type of property owners. I see we're coming down to the end of our time, so I'm gonna put it into this discussion. Just wanted to bring something to our, to
to our members' attention so that, that they could look look them up and look something up on their own. What kind of events do we have coming up? Well, next Monday, uh, a discussion about, it says tumultuous year for California property and taxation. It's really a Prop 19 discussion. That's the bulk of what's gonna happen on Monday, uh, February 4th, respect your own boundaries. I don't really know what that is. Do either of you know what, what that one is? Yeah, so that's part of the uh, the real property law section's new health and wellness committee, which Jr. and I are chairing. So oh, we're very the, excited. That's the one I got it. Cool. Yeah. yeah okay. So uh, Ritu Goswami is an attorney, and she speaks a lot. She actually wrote a book called um, "The New Billable Hour," and so she is going to be speaking about setting boundaries for yourself and your practice and, and legal practice, and then creating space and and time for yourself as well. So how to say no to clients, how to um, create time for the work-life balance. So that'll be okay. a great seminar. It's free, it's interactive. So we hope you end up, it'll be super fun. And then you can take Kelly's yoga class that following Saturday. And then on the 16th, um, you know, learning more about COVID era evictions. And then up in March, there's something dealing with um, what about a realtor, a real estate licensee, their obligation regarding private harassing speech, something that maybe you post on your own private Facebook page or Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So things to look out for. Reminder, everybody, just six days left um, to fill out your state bar MCLE compliance. If you're in the H3M group, don't forget about that. There's the link for you. And... Well, we will, we're kind of running out of time. I don't know if we have time for questions. Well, we got three we minutes. Will, we will be emailing the slides to attendees, to People asked about that. So we will be sending those out after the seminar. Okay. Oh, thank you. I didn't know that. That's really good news. Thank you. And these are also being recorded. So they're going to be available on, is it CLA's website or is it on Real, the RPLS Real section of the CLA website? Do you know? Real Properties website. The Real Property website is under the CLA umbrella. So I have a question. Neil, are you gonna grow your hair out so it resembles that photo at the beginning? <laughs> if only I could, JR, if only I could. Yeah. In my, in my younger days, my hair was more than shoulder length, but I'm well okay. past that now. <laughs> How about, did you ever have a mohawk or colored hair or anything like that? No, interesting enough, me no. My son, yes, mohawk and colored hair and different colors depending on which week it was. But no, I, I, I did have the ponytail at one point in time, but uh, no mohawks for me. Nice ponytail. That was at, where did you get, you went to Indiana? Uh, University of Illinois. Illinois, sorry. <laughs> May, May, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio. All, the, all us Midwesterners were kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're more Bever Beverly Hillbilly than I am, Neil. <laughs> yeah. I, He's going to get back so. at you. I, I frequently, when we used to go to work, I would wear my cowboy boots into work. And like every time I did, the comments never stopped. You know, no wingtip sho wing shoes for me. Uh, <laughs> Still need All a nice right. hat, though. I can't find a good one. Anyway, we're at, we're at the end. Thank you for joining us today. If you learned something, if you liked today's event, tell your friends, have them come join us next month, Thursday the 18th at 1230. Be there or be square. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. See you. Bye.